Birding. Okay. Welcome to our community forum today. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So please come forward and take the seats up front and in the middle. We appreciate your help and it helps us keep uh, seats in the back open for people who are late. We have hearing amplifiers. If anybody didn't get one, we'll pass them out to you. Just raise your hand. My name is Jean Martin, and I'm the coordinator for today's discussion called Cleveland Contemporary Art, Pushing the Boundaries. We hope to challenge you with new information and new ways of thinking about art and art museums. We have a mission in this church, to search and to serve. As Unitarian Universalists, we believe in the continuing search for truth and the importance of serving others. We organize these forums as a congregational service to the community to support personal reflection, social action, and to encourage individual and collective growth for all who attempt. I'm excited about today's forum because I love contemporary art. When I returned to Cleveland in the 1980s, I was excited to learn that a contem contemporary art was showcased here in a way I hadn't known growing up. <coughs> At a recent exhibit at the Contemporary at MOCA, it featured flowers on display, and people were asked to pass them out to passerbys outside. What a wonderful way of connecting art with the world. The new gallery was founded in 1968 by three Cleveland art patrons to feature important developments in contemporary art. The gallery went through several iterations. In 1996, Jill Snyder came on board. She leveraged those beginnings into an emblem of Cleveland's Renaissance and a hotbed of new ideas. Along the way, she's shaped conversations about the public value of museums and contemporary art. It later established the name MOCA Cleveland. In 2012, she completed with MOCA's staff and board an iconic $35 million building project in University Circle that anchors the Uptown <coughs> District. Its unique architecture is a showstopper. The project is paid for. MOCA is a non-collecting institution and recently changed its admission policy to free of charge. Now MOCA has gone from attracting 15,000 to some 41,000 visitors annually. She has expanded public outreach, commissioning new work by emerging artists, and deepening education through public programming. Under Snyder, MOCA is recognized internationally for its adventurous programming. Recent MOCA programs have straddled sectors as diverse as business, technology, healthcare, religion, activism, and Cleveland's vibrant food scene. A museum professional for over 30 years, Snyder has held positions at the Guggenheim Museum and Museum of Modern Art, the Aldrich Museum, the Friedman Gallery, and Albright College. She is co-founder of the National Association of Contemporary Art Museum Directors and serves on the boards of the Cleveland Leadership Center and University Circle, Inc. She is a member of In Council and the 50 Club. It's my pleasure to introduce MOCA's Executive Director, Jill Snyder. Thank you, and good morning. Can you all hear me? No, yes. I am, I've got a very fancy wiring system on, so it's completely invisible to me, which is great. Um, let me just say I'm really honored uh, to come and speak to you today especially since, as you'll hear in my talk, the last two years of uh, MOCA's, of my efforts and my team's effort has been so focused on what we describe as deepening our public value, which has so much to do with the values and the vision of where we are today. And uh, I really look forward to your questions and a conversation that follows uh, my presentation today. Um, well, Jean preempted a little bit about the history of the museum, and it's nice to know that there is an enthusiast um, who's followed our, our growth and development. But let me just add to this by saying that MOCA is, uh, has just celebrated at the tail end of this year our 50th anniversary. That makes us an institution that um, has grown up 
Uh, we are adults now, and we take our value in the community very seriously. And I want to talk a bit about that history. Um, do you think we can turn these lights down to make the uh, images a little crisper? Turn the lights up. Um, if you don't mind, I don't know. There, there we go. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> so um, you see here um, two of our founders uh, looking very, very um, 70s in their glamorous uh, uh, attire. That is Marjorie Talalay on the left and uh, Nina Sundell on the right. This is a picture that was taken uh, at the time when MOCA uh, was uh, located on Bellflower at University Circle on uh, the campus. Some of you might even remember. Has anyone, did, I, I'd be curious to know how many people um, went to the new gallery when it was in this location? Oh wow, I'm sure you have lots of good memories. And then as you know, subsequently we moved into this year's in Roebuck's building, uh, adjacent to the Cleveland Playhouse, and then now in our beautiful new home uh, at uni back at University Circle. But this brings us back to the early roots. And I want to make a few comments. So Nina Sundell, Marjorie Talalay, and Aggie Gund, who was a silent partner, were the three pioneering founders of what then was called the New Gallery. And I think it's important for us to reflect on 1968 as an important moment in time when there was certainly a lot of social and political upheaval uh, in the world. Uh, and particularly on our shores in the U.S. And contemporary art really was beginning to blossom um, out of the margins, a little bit more into the mainstream. And a lot of that had to do with what was going on in the art market. Um, for the first time, you had that generation known as the abstract expressionists in the 50s passing the torch to the pop artists of the 60s whose art was deemed commercially very viable, and you had for the first time the forces of contemporary art and artists being more avant-garde, meeting the market and the gallery scene. And in fact, Nina Sundell's father and mother, Leo Castelli and Ileana Sonnabend, were the two pioneers of Soho in New York, which established the beginnings of this commercial art scene that dominated the 70s and 80s in New York. Um, Leo Castelli was the first to show Jasper Johns, Robert Rauschenberg, Jim Dine, Roy Lichtenstein, that whole generation. And why is that relevant is because Nina had a direct portal to that inventory of pop artists in New York and at one point I did some research, and while I, it's not scientific, I do believe that uh, the new gallery was the, was, um, showed more of, uh, had more exhibitions of pop artists than any other place in the, in the U.S. outside of New York. So it was this vibrant little hotbed of showing avant-garde art here in Cleveland, Ohio in the 1970s. Um, together, the two of them, uh, over the first decade, built the institution to have a, a vitality that also reached into the community through art programming that brought artists into the public schools. Um, eventually, as you know, um, they outgrew their small home, which was really um, uh, like a fraternity house. And in the late 1980s, had the opportunity to work with the development of the Cleveland Playhouse and to occupy the second floor of the uh, Sears and Roebuck's building, uh, which was renovated by Richard Fleischman. And in 1991, we moved into that 23,000 square foot building uh, and took over this massive space. That corresponded with uh, an era of, of greater ambition and of engaging artists to do larger scale projects and also to do large themed shows that looked at the connection of art and ideas of our time. Um, when I arrived in the late, uh, in as um, Jean mentioned, in very late 96 and, in, uh, and beginning in 1997, uh, there was a transition of the institution from its founding director, Marjorie Talalay, 
to what was going to define its next phase of its growth. Um, anyone here who has ever studied entrepreneur, entrepreneurship would know that it takes a very risk-taking founder to establish and, and um, to sort of fuel the first phase of an organization. And Marjorie was such that person. She was vibrant, she was full of um, fire and brimstone and vinegar and grit and um, she, um, I would say, really took this place to create the DNA. What she probably wasn't was a really good business person because by the time I arrived, we had moved into a 23,000 square foot building from a 3,000 square foot building without a business plan. Uh, and not as if I was the, you know, trained as a business person, but it was clear that we kind of were on shaky ground and needed to really think about a sustainability model. And um, so for those five years that I, um, the first three to five years after I arrived, there was a great deal of work with the board and with the community of what I would say sort of turning it to a more public, outward-facing organization to uh, begin working more in partnership with the community and beginning in the early 2000s, a conversation about relocation. Now you might ask, well, why would you need to relocate if you were situated in this fabulous large facility, very low rent, I should add, um, with a very long lease, so there was a great deal of stability in that uh, particular location, and we were embedded within the Cleveland Playhouse, which uh, the vision was that we would be a kind of integrated art center. Um, I would say that um, this speaks a little bit more to understanding the industry of the arts, but in actual fact, the performing arts and the visual arts, the behavior of visitors doesn't have a lot of um, synergy. If you go to a play, you have a date with a specific event at a particular time, and typically you are organizing that around a set of activities, which in probably includes having dinner beforehand, finding a parking garage, arriving at the theater at the right time, seeing the play, which is usually two to two and a half hours, Sleeping. getting back into said car and driving home. That doesn't leave a whole lot of time to say, let's go see an art exhibition. <laughs> and for anyone who knew the Cleveland Playhouse, uh, walk down an incredibly long corridor and up two flights of steps through three closed doors in order to find said contemporary art center. So um, it, it was that not only did that, that, that um, sort of ideal vision of the two coming together never really um, feed each other, but increasingly it became clear that um, museums are dependent on walk-in traffic. And where we were on the second floor uh, behind three closed doors in a neighborhood that was largely um, uh, commercial was not the greatest location for us. As one of my board members said, no one ever woke up in the morning and said, let's go eat at Wendy's, have our car detailed, and see a contemporary art show. <laughs> that, would have been, that would have been the experience you would have if you were a pedestrian in our neighborhood. So beginning in um, early um, 2000s, um, remarkably, as early as 2002, we began talking about um, relocation. And um, so that would mean, if you fast forward to our opening of this building in uh, 2012, it was a 10-year journey. But it was a journey that was marked by a lot of different uh, phases and some potholes in the road. Um, first, we had to um, challenge ourselves with uh, a kind of divided board, some of whom felt that returning to University Circle was our proper location, others who felt that downtown was a dynamic, vital place for us um, next to the Cleveland, uh, to the Cleveland um, uh, to Playhouse Square. And I'm thinking, again, with the theater? <laughs> I'm not sure being next to the theater was, you know, again, 
what this expectation that because a million people were going to see Broadway plays at Playhouse Square. Um, in my heart, I, I preferred uh, University Circle. Why? Because contemporary art, I believe, is a, a very porous art form. It is a connector to ideas. I felt we needed to be embedded within the university. I felt we needed to be in proximity to the history of art uh, through the Cleveland Museum of Art. And I loved being in proximity to the vitality of the students at the Cleveland Institute of Art. And there were neighborhoods adjacent that, I, that it felt as if we had a more op greater opportunity to engage with, uh, with neighbors. Um, so we, um, I, I could give a whole other talk about the building project, which I won't, only to say that it was the greatest um, rewarding professional experience of my life, but one that was long and arduous and that um, encountered a global recession and um, many uh, trials and tribulations. But I will say that the community responded beautifully to our vision. Um, as we've said, we were a no asset. We, we owned no real estate. We had no endowment. We were a $1.5 million scrappy organization. There was no reason in the world why anyone should believe that we could um, pull this off, but, um, but we did. We had vision, we had an incredible um, board, and we made the case to the community that contemporary art symbolized innovation, creativity, and risk. And that resonated at that moment of time in what Northeast Ohio aspired to uh, move itself into the 21st century that you need places like this that are at the cutting edge that bring this kind of innovative approach. We also made the case that young people want to move to cities that are dominated by creative, the creative class, that have places that um, can gather around um, new ideas and ideas that came from a global arena. So here we are. 2012, we've opened the new building, um, and as Jean mentioned, but I do want to reiterate, we are a non-collecting contemporary art museum. In Europe, that model is called a Kunsthalle, or an art hall, which means its focus is on the development and presentation of exhibitions and programming that supports their interpretation, but is not uh, burdened by the um, by collecting and by all that is involved in storing and presenting a permanent collection. Um, as we approached our 50th anniversary, now jump forward, we've been in the building for five years. We kicked the tires, figured out how did this amazing thing that we willed to happen, how did it truly operate, who was coming, who were these visitors, more than 50% of the people who were coming were brand new. We wanted to understand them better, so we began doing a lot more of self-reflection about our growth. And as we approached the 50th anniversary, I felt that it was important for us to make a statement to the community that our 50th anniversary would be celebrated through the notion of, of um, giving back. And so, we set about designing this season as a set of, of milestones that would culminate in going free, eliminating admission in March, and in opening a season which, is based, which was based on the idea of exchange of kindness between strangers. Um, and um, Jean mentioned that she came to opening night, which this is here. The main gallery featured an artist, um, Li Mingwei, a Buddhist-trained Taiwanese artist who resides in Paris, who is um, world-renowned. His work has been presented in major museums, including the Louvre and the Met. And we, I was very proud to uh, share with the community, gave him his first solo museum show 
in 1998. And so 20 years later, the opportunity to celebrate that um, anniversary and to re-engage him seemed a, the, like a great um, opportunity. So the three projects that um, um, formed this season and this exhibition were based on Ming Wei's philosophy about uh, kindness between strangers. The, the one that you're viewing here is called Sonic Blossom. This is a performance piece that we staged at MOCA over one month and then several months later it was performed over several weeks at the Cleveland Museum of Art in their permanent collection gallery. It's a very simple premise. It involves operatic uh, singers. We use students from the Cleveland Institute of Music. They are dressed in a ceremonial garb and um, a singer comes out into the gallery um, wanders among the uh, visitors and walks up to a visitor and says, may I give you the gift of song? If the visitor accepts, they are invited to sit in a chair and the singer um, sings a, um, a uh, Schubert Lieder, which is a three minute love song. There are a series of them that um, he wrote and this performance takes place spontaneously in the context of the public galleries where the visitors become sort of spontaneous uh, witnesses to this exchange. I will say that um, a high percentage of, of visitors who receive the gift of song are moved to tears. It is a very special experience that um, that people describe as being um, a moment of joy or a moment of pure emotion. Um, so Sonic Blossom was accompanied by, well actually this is a better one, on the left hand you see this, um, it's a 40 foot long granite table which um, has down the center a crack that has <coughs> placed live, um, in this case Gerber daisies. And visitors are invited to take a flower, and if, they, um, if they're inspired to do so, they're instructed that when they leave the museum, that they find a stranger and give the flower to that stranger. Now, if you think about that for a moment, it sounds like a very beautiful gesture and act, but actually it requires a degree of courage to walk up to somebody um, and with the, um, the um, potential of rejection and um, or of not getting the response that your act of generosity is intended. But in fact, we saw that many people um, did um, make this gesture. Many of them kept the flower for themselves, which was fine too. The artist himself said that was perfectly within the realm of the, uh, the, of the work. Um, and um, that um, required sourcing 8,000 Gerber daisies over the course of four months. We had the, um, the generous sponsorship of Bloom's uh, floral shop, uh, and that was a, a very nice um, uh, gesture on their part. Um, the third project is called the Mending Project, and if you look to the left, you see a table with some chairs, and the middle image shows you a mender with a visitor. The premise of the mending project is that visitors are invited to bring an article of clothing that requires mending. Now this is not a tailoring shop. This is Think of this as a symbolic gesture of mending uh, with the metaphor on mending as a kind of healing activity. And the artist's requirement, only requirement, is that the visitor sit for the duration of the time that the article of clothing is being mended. And by the way, mending could be embellishment. There were many fabulous little um, frothy fabrications that took place on sweaters as a result of the mending project. But during this time, the <coughs> mender, who were 70 volunteers who we invited to participate, and visitors had ex exchange of discovery of two humans coming together, 
uh, just around the simple activity of an article of clothing being stitched. The menders uh, were required every day to write in a journal about their encounters with visitors. And I had the um, opportunity to sit and read through that journal, which took over 70 pages. It was such um, an incredibly moving experience to read about some of these random <coughs> encounters where such things, and I know this sounds a little corny, but you know, someone coming and saying, uh, the, the, the mender saying, can I mend something for you? And someone saying, can you mend a broken heart? Mm -hmm. Or mm -hmm. having a small child bring something and, and instead of an uh, article of clothing being mended, have the mender make a ring for them out of the, out of the, um, uh, the um, thread and that ring becoming a magical object for the child or for two people to discover that they were distant relatives. <laughs> or for, um, I was a mender on one occasion and um, had a couple who had traveled in from somewhere in Northeast Ohio, but not so close in proximity, where the gentleman was um, receiving treatment for dementia. And that poignancy of encounter with someone who is present but is not so present was a really um, a moving experience for me. And I thought how wonderful that the caretaker felt that this was an activity that would be meaningful. So such kinds of encounters, and it reminds us of these little acts of, in all of our days that feed to and deepen our humanity. Which takes me into the second part of my uh, talk, which is to talk about how does contemporary art deepen our humanity, and why is it important, urgent, and relevant for this moment in time. Um, to, in 2015, we created a strategic plan, and um, we threw out the notion that a strategic plan had to have a mission, vision, uh, whatever that is. And we challenged ourselves to say five words. What were the five key words? And we thought of this as our DNA. And you see them here as a kind of overlapping um, image. The vanguard <coughs> refers to our roots as a, a pioneering institution that shows new work by emerging artists. The um, At the bottom, Discovery is our philosophy toward education, that we are not teaching mastery, we're teaching critical thinking and open-minded inquiry. Enterprising is the way that we work. We're very resourceful in responding to contemporary artists whose work requires tremendous amount of, um, of flexibility and ingenuity to pull off so for example, sourcing 8,000 daisies. <laughs> um, and in the middle, the rooted in the cosmopolitan are two sides of our um, engagement. Cosmopolitan is our global reach, and cosmopolitan embeds the notion of diversity, that if you are truly working on a global scale, you are reflecting um, so much difference in perspective. Rooted had to do with our commitment to being here in Cleveland reflecting the specific interests and needs of our community. As we approached our 50th anniversary, we began to focus more on the rooted and cosmopolitan aspects of our, um, of our um, strategic plan, calling it the MOCA 5.0 plan. At that point, it was 2017, it was the fifth anniversary of our building, anticipating our 50th anniversary, thus, 5.0. And there we began um, to reflect on the notion of what we wanted to do to deepen our public value. And here I want to just read a little bit about um, this as a philosophy. Um, Elaine Gurian, who is a renowned museum educator, makes the case that museums are part of a set of civic spaces that when tra safely traversed by strangers add to social cohesion. 
for Gurian, safe public spaces, which encourage learning and debate, such as museums and libraries, can move us from passive acceptance and civility to understanding and even empathy. So empathy lends itself well to the museum field's imperative for inclusion. This year, as I mentioned, MOCA launched a set of initiatives called Open House that focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion. Designed to build empathy with and among visitors, these initiatives are core to the museum's philosophy and practice to make the museum more welcoming and collaborative for all audiences. Situated within a broader national dialogue about the 21st century role of museums, MOCA's open house initiatives embrace the societal imperative for greater civility, social justice, and informed public discourse. Comprehensive in scope, open house initiatives assert the museum as a safe gathering place, a public forum, and a contemplative haven to process our multicultural world. Our open house initiatives include free admission for all, the creation of a diversity curatorial fellowship, an engagement guide and apprenticeship program, and enhanced on-site programming for families and teens. In support of these initiatives, MOCA proudly received the Bold Initiatives Grant from the Toma Art Foundation in Chicago, a new program dedicated to funding small and mid-sized institutions and museums taking bold steps to increase attendance through outreach, diversity, and inclusion. Um, so I want to just show you, since going free in March, we have had a 67% increase in walk-in attendance. But perhaps most rewarding for us is the dramatic increase in engagement from our local neighborhoods, which is a lower income, um, more predominantly African American community where especially on weekends we're seeing many intergenerational families coming to visit the museum. Also astonishing is almost 200% <coughs> increase in youth but particularly the population of teens and I am super excited to engage um, um, that population who are a bit um, um, unconventional in engagement. If anyone who has had teens or knows teens, they don't exactly like to be engaged. <laughs> they like to have a place to hang and feel it's okay to be there, but engagement not so much. Um, I do want to just show you here um, as um, a way in which we thought about open house. Um, I, I think it's important to um, consider that one think when one thinks about engagement that it is a holistic enterprise it is not something that is uh, you know a b c and let's go free lower economic barrier and boom aren't we great everyone's coming it is a thoughtful um, um, comprehensive set of initiatives that seeks to situate ourselves into an engagement with our community. Um, inclusive language was a key part of this, changing our voice so that we, when people came in, they felt like this was relevant. Contemporary art can be a foreign language. It's our job to build that bridge for our visitor, visitors. We also launched, I mentioned, an engagement guide program this we are incredibly proud of. We are only two months into it. We developed an approach toward all of our on-site, um, our on, oops, am I being called off stage? <laughs> uh, our on, all of our frontline um, personnel, so that would be people at the welcome desk, um, people who are in our learning centers, and all the guards are all now one cohort and they are trained as educators. So wherever you are in the museum, at whatever level you are, you can be supported in your visit and your experience. This is a group of young people. <coughs> Am I doing something? No. 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 Um, no. <laughs> It's 
program um, just started. It is a cohort of young professionals. We challenged ourselves to hire this cohort reflecting the demographic of Cuyahoga County so that the people who are um, welcoming our visitors look like the visitors who are coming to the museum. And we also are training them so that they can be cultural workers. So it will include uh, field trip, board mentorships, and other kinds of educational activities for them. Um, this is a one-year program where we hope that these young professionals then will be launched further in their careers. And, uh, and then finally, doing more on-site um, engagement activities in the galleries. Our learning labs are set up to ask questions. As I said, our philosophy is about discovery. Here is um, an example of the kind of question, and I would like to point out here how incredibly low-tech this activity is. It requires post-it notes and a, and a pen. And with that, we invite our visitors to have a collective community conversation through their um, response to the questions that we ask. Um, I want to go back and end. <coughs> by talking about our town halls. Um, as I mentioned, um, that the, our initiatives were inspired by Elaine Gurian's profound assertion that a museum, first and foremost, must serve as a site for civility. However, with civility as a foundational value, museums must, I believe, must push to do more. Art has become integral in the delivery of this new museum paradigm. Consider an artist-run initiative founded by artists Hank Willis Thomas and Eric Gottesman. Four Freedoms, which you're seeing down here, is a platform for creative civic engagement, discourse, and direct action inspired by FDR's Four Freedoms. Freedom of speech, freedom of worship, freedom from want, freedom from fear. Four Freedoms exhibitions, installations, and public programs use art to deepen public discussions on civic issues. In 2016, MOCA and Four Freedoms launched a series of town hall discussions that are co-produced with the City Club of Cleveland. Um, Four Freedoms town halls provide open platforms for civil, topical conversations that seek to encourage a more active, collaborative, inclusive, and empathic community in which artists are always part of that civic conversation. Topics that we have explored through our town halls have ranged from racial inequity, immigration, faith and mass incarceration, teens and gun violence. Most recently, we presented Love is a Political Act to emphasize the role of compassion and empathy in our democracy. So by promoting civility as a foundational value, by assuming an active civic role through its exhibitions, and programming, and by engaging artists as core to this endeavor, MOCA is setting the stage for the museum of the future. The vision of this museum is one that aspires to build trust with its visitors, and through that trust, to inspire those visitors to deepen their humanity. This may simply be conveyed in the joyful expressions of a child, feelings of peace and well-being from a first-time visitor, or feelings of gratitude and inspiration from a member. Referring back to Elaine Gurian's imperative for civility, I believe such feelings are both in short supply and great demand in our increasingly anxious lives. So I thank you and look forward to your questions. Thank you, Jill. That was terrific. That was starting. Before we start our question and answers, we're going to pass around clipboards to sign 
for you to sign if you're not on our email list and you would like to receive information about future sessions. Uh, we don't share your email. Feel free to take um, brochures. We have three rules for Q&A. Our microphone holders hold, um, choose the person, not the speaker. Keep your questions short. No speeches, please. And hold the microphone horizontal and very close to your mouth so everyone can hear. Jim. First, uh, I want to say I'm always in awe of your ability to articulate the vision and how you've translated it uh, for the community. Um, so thank you. I'm curious, not being a native Clevelander, my understanding is the Cleveland Museum of Art was not always so interested in contemporary art. And part of the initial function of uh, what was formerly uh, known as something else, uh, was that they were filling that gap. Now that the museum seems to have taken more of an interest in contemporary art, could you talk about what your relationship is with them? Thank you. It's such a good observation and question. Um, so the simple answer is rising tide lifts all ships. This community, as you mentioned, for, in my view, um, for a long time was devoid of education around contemporary art that came from the Encyclopedic Museum. It's incredibly critical for any, what I think of a healthy ecosystem uh, around art and culture in a city is for the contemporary, the Encyclopedic Museum to fulfill the whole spectrum from the past to the present. And that becomes important in validating new forms, new ideas, new expressions in art. If the main museum is not doing that, which they did not, I agree, do a terribly good job with for many years, um, it means that institutions like ours have the burden of that education and don't have the advantage of situating it in a dialogue with the past, which you can do with a permanent collection. But now we have a healthier ecosystem, a more vibrant contemporary art uh, program at the Cle Cleveland Museum of Art, and we are actively engaged with our partners there. In fact, they continually poach from my staff. <laughs> I'm joking, but we're always thrilled when people move on to the world, but their public person who handles their public programming is my head of public programming. Our curators um, are engaged with one another. You saw we just shared the Sonic Blossom exhibition, uh, performance exhibition, and um, we have shared board members, um, and as you know, Front Triennial, now this new uh, festival, binds us together through um, every three years a big contemporary art. So I, I see nothing but positive, um, mutually reinforcing um, activities at the moment. Uh, thank you, Jill, for a wonderful presentation. I'm especially interested in your engagement personnel. I'm a docent in another museum. And I've been through MOCA with these engagement people. Did you get that idea from somewhere, and how are they trained? Right, such a good question. So we're not the first one to launch what we would call, um, they're called different things in different museums. It is on, I would definitely say it's on the vanguard of museum practice. Um, and to me, it absolutely makes sense. Guards, most of the time, they are just standing in the gallery anticipating something bad's going to happen to work of art, which normally doesn't happen. So usually there is a cautionary presence, which is sort of such a wasted opportunity because really visitors, what they really need in the gallery is support for their encounter with the art, um, especially contemporary art. So we are in a very early phase. We uh, have a fantastic curator of education who has a graduate degree from the Bank Street School um, in New York, which is one of the top museum education programs in the country. Uh, and this kind of training is difficult. Anyone, it's really no different than customer service, right? 
getting people who really understand customer service. And so what we've said, we're hiring for emotional intelligence, almost more than anything. Um, they don't have to be experts in contemporary art. In fact, they shouldn't be, because the whole notion is to lower the intimidation factor around contemporary art. So they, they went through a whole summer training um, to orient them to um, these kinds of uh, engagement. And um, I have to tell you, we haven't even begun intercept surveys because we wanted them to get their sea legs. We've only two months into it. But the visitor response has been anecdotally amazing. People walk down all the time to the visitor uh, desk on their way out and say, by the way, that young person who came up and talked to me in the gallery was so informative. It was so great to talk to them. And um, so I have to say we're very encouraged early on. Now, not all of them will succeed. Um, and we understand that we'll need to replenish. How many hours is that summer long training? Um, they went through two months of training. Um, and they were here, I don't know I don't know the exact hours, but it was very deep and very extensive and a lot of on their feet practice with one another. Um, thank you. Jill, thank you for an informative presentation. I've been aware of the museum since its founding and I've been a member for a long time. Thank you. And I adore your building. <laughs> I adore your gift shop and I'm very excited by the personnel. Now, and I've also liked a lot of the, of the programs that I've attended, but I'm curious because I've not been aware of the forums. How do you promote them? They seem to be well attended, or <laughs> unless that's not a typical yeah. slide. Well, that's, I, that puts a question mark in my head and makes me think we're not doing our, a good enough job because if you're a member, you should be aware of them. Um, so I can't really say... How do you promote them? So, well, we do promote them, and they are all on our website, and it is uh, part of our communication outward. I will say that because these town halls, um, the nature of the content being specific to a theme or an issue, we are working... All of these town halls engage partners. So if we are working with faith and mass incarceration, we worked with the Lutheran Ministry, which works with um, retraining for incarcerated individuals, and we partner with them in a outreach and communication strategy. Often, these town halls, I will say, are populated by people who have a specific interest in the topic. Um, or have been, um, like the faith and mass incarceration, uh, the facilitator from Lutheran Mis Ministry asked people um, how many people had been formerly incarcerated and half the, the audience raised their hand. So it does tend to draw from people who are specifically interested. Same with teens and gun violence. More than half the of the people who participated had had direct experience with gun violence. Um, but it does make me think maybe we need to be doing a better job. Well, are you dependent on the website primarily for, for getting the word out on things? Um, no, we do. Because most people don't necessarily go to the website. Exactly. Regularly. No, we use, social, we use social media, we use radio, we use a whole series of platforms. Uh, the question that I'm asking myself is whether we actually send out a, a card yeah, that's to our membership, and I'm not sure too. that we do that. It's, it gets expensive to print cards and send them out for yeah. every, so we do about 100 events a year, so if, if we have to pick and choose when we do that. Email. And email. Yeah. Yes, and we do email, yes. We do, we do email, we do a, uh, I think, um, uh, definitely seasonal, if not multi-times through a season, emails that list all of our programming. So the question is, we have, most of our members' emails, it may be there could be uh, a lapse. Um, if you want to give me your card at the end, I'm happy to go back and look. Yes, next question right here. Um, New York's always been the center for art in the world, it used to be Paris. Any chance Cleveland's going to take over? <laughs> Let's will it to happen. And I will say, based on our experience in the last, even since we opened the building, 
I didn't talk much about the global positioning piece because I focused today on our public value, but the work and the exhibitions that we've been doing, particularly the, the current one, this um, is the first solo museum exhibition of a renowned contemporary Chinese artist, Lu Wei. Um, that's gaining tremendous amount of attention through the global um, art press and um, recognition. Um, I'm finding that artists are really liking coming to Cleveland and working with us because precisely because if you work in Chicago, New York, LA, some of these larger cities, you can really, um, what I call you get end up in the art world bubble where you're engaged with the, the, um, the stakeholders of critics and collectors and curators and galleries. You come to Cleveland where there's less of that, um, of that infrastructure and you work much more directly engaged with community. And, and there are artists who really find that extremely um, rewarding. So um, I would say it, it's definitely on the rise. And I think that the Front Triennial, because of the power of it working regionally and engaging all of the, I don't know if everyone here knows about the Front Triennial, but it's going to be in its second iteration in 2021. It's a multi, it's a regionally based, multi-institutional contemporary art festival over three months in the summer with, and including site-specific public art installations. That has, um, because of the power of all of us working together, has really also created more awareness around Cleveland. Cleveland's, I think people are seeing it as very, very, very hot right now in the contemporary art world. Thank you for everything you do and have done and Thank are you. doing um, and continue to do, I'm sure. I need to say thank you as the former um, photography professor who has brought many, many classes to the museum um, and my grandchildren. Um, this morning I took a sweater to wear and then proceeded to fold a basket of laundry and decided to wear this jacket which was embellished Let me see. by the Mending Project. Can we see? It just had two little buttons. Oh, um, but I thought it was interesting and coincidental that I put it on. Certainly not intentional. Um, I'm wondering if your um, uh, membership has gone up. I have renewed my membership, and I hope other people will as well. Um, and I wonder about the soundscape hallway, um, which I never, ever leave the museum without going uh -huh. down because I absolutely love it. But it's not, I, I, I have a sense that it's, people are not aware of the soundscape. Well, first of all, thank you for um, sharing your embellishment from the Mending Project. That's really very special. I didn't expect that. Um, and um, your um, second question or the second part was um, about, I'm sorry. The membership. The membership. The membership. You know, we are very curious to see what happens with membership. Um, the conventional wisdom would be membership would go down because you've taken away a transactional benefit of membership. But frankly, I don't think it's going to. I think most of our members see it as annual fund yeah. and yeah. Um, join because they want to support what we're doing. And if anything, I would love to see a counterintuitive response, which is because we have eliminated um, admission, that more people are going to become members just to reward and support the lost revenue. Um, it's too early to say. We just went free in March, and so the annual cycle is not complete yet, but we are definitely looking at that to see what happens. And finally, I am happy to tell you that many people do experience Stair A. Stair A is the inner stair. It's actually the fire stair, but it's publicly accessible. And after a year or two, we recognized it was a fantastic sound gallery. And so we've been engaging artist projects that are sound-based, and many visitors enjoy this kind of special experience of walking up the stair and hearing um, the pieces that we install there. So you for, by no means are alone. And the visitor reception desk always <coughs> encourages people to experience it. Not everyone wants to walk. 
they, you know, they take the elevator, so they, they miss that you opportunity. Walk down. You can walk down. Yeah. We tell them. We tell them to take the elevator up. Yes. I guess I'd like to just reinforce uh, what others have said, but my wife and I went yesterday. And in the past, I've always thought of as contemporary art as a little bit intimidating. But from the, from the reception desk in the front, where they made us feel very welcome, and to the, uh, the attendants in the galleries, I mean, it was just a, a special experience. I mean, they actively help you to understand and answer your questions in, in a way that I've never experienced at a museum before. And we had so much fun. It was just, it was just a great experience. So. Well, thank you. Um, and just to answer the question that was asked about this engagement guide program, as I said, it's not unique in the country. There aren't. Um, it's definitely on the on the vanguard. But I think what's unique about our program is treating it as an apprenticeship program, and the commitment to giving the this cohort professional opportunities that will advance them beyond this sort of entry uh, position. I've been to MOCA, but it's been a long time. And any time I go to any venue, my biggest concern is parking. I want safe parking, not too far, because I can't really walk too far. What have you got? Well, first of all, I would just like to say what a tremendous advancement we have made in the past seven years, because when I used to attend forums like this, the very first question was about parking. <laughs> so I think this was success. In fact, so much so that after a few a few times, I, I would just start the Q&A and say, let me just begin by talking about parking. <laughs> um, the fact is that um, there is ample parking um, in proximity within w one block of MOCA, three different parking venues, actually four if you consider behind um, uh, where Uptown is. There's the Ford lot, the Uptown, uh, the um, um, Triangle parking lot, and then the surface lot next to the Marriott Courtyard. Um, the challenge is that they're, over the years, they're not, they're each owned by different uh, entities, the university, UCI, etc. And the signage was not very um, yeah. effective. Yeah. And um, I think it's improved. And the um, someone was telling me today about a story of you know, the uh, transaction of how you pay also was not very effective. I think they are trying to make improvements. Um, but um, there, there is parking. Um, I think it's safe. Um, in the sense that it's lit, it's visible. We haven't had um, any um, pattern of, of incidents. Um, and we took that very seriously so that even though we don't control any of the parking, we have an icon on our website if someone goes to our website that says parking. And it leads them directly to where uh, parking would be. But we're aware that that was a huge frustration. Oh, yeah. And and it, it's such a case study in marketing because in the first year, word got out that there was no parking. And then it's not reality, it's perception. But perception is reality. And that was a huge um, barrier for people coming. Thank you. It's helpful to know about that icon on the website. You could probably shout. Mm -hmm. oh, I just got a question. Oh, sorry. I didn't know that. I, I was thinking. Uh, Louder. Hello. I was thinking uh -huh. about possibly having some sort of a contest uh, for Cleveland City Schools where they might have a poster contest to design a poster for you that would give your basic information about free admission, your hours, and uh, perhaps depending on what's going on, maybe an upcoming exhibition. Uh, I don't know how involved you'd want it to be, but it might be an opportunity to uh, engage with some of the more local community. Show them the walking path. Tell them about the buses that are free around University Circle, that kind of thing. Sounds like a terrific idea. We'd be happy to put you in touch with our marketing team. <laughs> Are you offering free uh, volunteer activity? Well, I got a pretty big volunteer shop right now. 
I would have to, have to be talking. But I'm not, I'm not a transportation person. How do you, how do you plan to fill that deficit uh, since you're offering your service to you? Mary, thank you. She is not a plan for my development office. <laughs> um, I obviously this was done with a great deal of planning, and um, 18 months I would say in advance of launching free admission in March of 2019, we began the activity of, um, of finding funding to offset the lost revenue, and um, so we currently have multi-year support from the Cleveland Foundation, the Fowler Foundation, Connor Foundation, Smith Foundation, and Krieger Foundation. Um, but it will run out. And so I have, um, what do they say, kind of the, the running lead. <laughs> so um, the short answer to that is ultimately we need to grow our endowment so that we have um, that in, you know, the interest that comes from that would give us a, a long-term, in, in perpetuity, sustainable model. And I'm in, um, you know, we're le leading that conversation with my board now. Hi, normally people don't think about voter registration when they go to an art museum uh, or a contemporary art show. But we noticed that you were drawing a lot of young people and they are a target market for people that move a lot and need to update their registration. So NOVA, Northeast Ohio Voter Advocates, uh, asked to have uh, the opportunity to register voters. You folks said yes immediately. And we had a successful couple days yes. of that. So I just want to yes. underline how open you are to community engagement yes. and getting people um, uh, you know, established in that. Well, thank you for sharing that, um, and we will do that again.